Welcome to this uh, virtual book launch for Jeffrey Schlegel-Milch's new book on Rethinking Readiness, A Brief Guide to 21st Century Mega Disasters. I'm Ruth DeFries. I'm the Denning Family Professor of Sustainable Development at Columbia University in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology. And I am also chair of the faculty of the Earth Institute. I'm looking forward to hearing about this book in which Jeff examines multiple types of disasters, among which uh, is pandemics. And uh, he will be discussing the, the, these multiple types of disasters, their impacts, how society can prepare for them, and how we can build a more resilient and sustainable society to weather such disasters. At the end of uh, the remarks, we will have plenty of time for Q&A, so please keep your questions and enter them into the Q&A box, which you can find in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Before we get to the topic of the book, I wanted to say a few words about the Earth Institute. The purpose of the Earth Institute at Columbia University is to bring together environmental scientists, social scientists, economists, lawyers, public health experts, policy experts, all of the expertise that we need to together work towards developing possible pathways for society to address some of the most profound challenges facing humanity, including climate change, disasters, uh, health, other very important challenges. Of course, the pandemic is at the forefront of our minds, and uh, it is one of the areas that this interdisciplinary uh, work can shed some light. The Earth Institute addresses disaster management uh, more generally, climate and health, the risk of emergencies compounded by events such as hurricanes and wildfires, and many other uh, issues. So both of our guests today are top experts in disaster preparedness and recovery. Jeff Schlegelmilch is the, the author of the book, and he is a research scholar and director of the National Center for Disaster Preparedness here at Columbia University's Earth Institute. His expertise includes public health preparedness, community resilience, integration of private and public sector capabilities, he, had, he has advised leaders on preparedness systems and policy at all levels of government. He oversees many projects here at Columbia University, including the award-winning Resilient Children, Resilient Communities Initiative. Before Jeff joined Columbia, he was manager for the international and non-healthcare business sector for the Yale New Haven a health System Center for Emergency Preparedness and Disaster Response. He was epidemiologist and emergency planner for the Boston Public Health Commission. So thank you very much, Jeff, for writing this book, which I know you started long before the current pandemic. Uh, and thank you for joining us today. Chloe Dabrowski is, uh, is uh, the facilitator for today's discussion. She is the president and CEO of Disaster Recovery Institute International and an internationally recognized expert on all aspects of risk and resilience. Chloe is the youngest and first female chief executive to oversee and expand uh, Disaster Recovery Institute's international network that spans across 100 countries. She has uh, advised on global risk across five continents and conducted briefings for government officials, uh, the US Congress, the European Commission, the United Nations. She's a senior Forbes contributor, a Rockefeller 100 Resilient Cities subject matter advisor, adjunct professor at New York University, and member of the Council on Foreign uh, Relations, United Nations Office for uh, Office of Disaster Disaster Risk Reduction uh, sits on the board of the DRI and the Bard College at Simon's Rock Board of Advisors. So we are in very good hands. Thank you very much for 
Chloe for joining us today and I will turn it over to you to lead the discussion. Thank you so much, Ruth, uh, for that kind introduction. I'm very happy to be here and to be chatting with my, my friend and colleague, Jeff Schlegelmilch. Uh, it's a pleasure. I believe the last time we did something like this, it was on your podcast and you were interviewing me. So it's kind of nice to do it the other way around. Right, a little bit of payback. So I uh, <laughs> uh, probably should have been nicer, but <laughs> glad to be here. Glad to, uh, I'll, be, I'll be sure to return it in kind. Absolutely. <laughs> so let's start with a really tough question here. Um, First of all, you talk about mega disasters um, in the title of the book. And so I wanted you to kind of start with a definition of what is a mega disaster and what differentiates that from any other typical kind of disaster event? Yeah, so I, 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 it's a good question. And I'll start with a bit of a confession that there are a lot of terms that we use that are actually not extraordinarily well defined around the edges. Uh, resilience is another one that takes on a lot of different meanings. But for me personally, the, the way that I look at mega disasters are disasters that are of a scale that are so large that they disrupt the very systems that are designed to respond to them. Um, and then you can get to even broader categories that are very societal disrupting um, and can actually disrupt this, the trajectory of societal development in sort of these mega mega disasters. Um, and that's a, a, a bit of the focus of the book is how, you know, uh, the, these disasters can become mega disasters and these mega disasters can become of a scale and a persistence that actually um, alters our, our trajectory and the way we live our lives in, in ways that are in, sometimes incalculable. Um, yeah, I think that that's important to to kind of clarify that they're so much larger. Um, I know we'll get it on Twitter if I talk about disasters all the time as opposed to hazards. I know there's a big distinction within our community, but I, I, I would like to clarify that generally I'm using disasters more for a, a general audience rather than kind of a specialist audience. Um, since we're kind of crossing out of the discipline a little bit, I understand that there is a distinction. So we're going to move forward with disasters. And um, I know that your framework identifies kind of five major types of mega disasters. So I don't know that we'll have time to go into all of them on this call, um, but uh, I'd like to at least touch on them. So what are the five and, and why did you choose these? Yeah, so, so this book actually started as a, as a conversation with uh, Dr. Erwin Redliner, who was the uh, a founding director of the National Center for Disaster Preparedness, and remains a, a senior research scholar there and oversees a lot of our pandemic work, work with children in disasters, among others. And we were talking about, you know, what are, how, how would we look at the 21st century? How would we look at the different kinds of disasters um, that, that we need to be preparing for that are emblematic of the kinds of challenges that we face? And uh, he had this notion that there were these five uh, around um, pandemics or bio threats. Um, and that includes pandemics like COVID-19 we're experiencing now, but also um, uh, healthcare acquired infections, bioterrorism, things like that. Climate change, um, obviously a, a, a big topic of, of interest and deep expertise for the Earth Institute as well as many others. Um, critical infrastructure failure, how we're seeing this eroding infrastructure that we take for granted every day that could seriously disrupt our ability to get from here to there or keep the lights on. Um, the uh, uh, cybersecurity and cyber threats, uh, as we're increasingly wired, as we're connected more and more virtually. Uh, a good example right here today and how we're living our lives in the midst of this pandemic and uh, the vulnerabilities that creates, as well as nuclear conflict and how some of these age old um, problems, age old concerns haven't really gone away. They've just changed form and with it have presented new vulnerabilities, but also new opportunities uh, for uh, mitigating against them. But I think that, that the key sort of common thread between all these and, and the purpose of the book is really to identify. An okay, he seems to be frozen for everyone. So we'll, we'll give him a moment and see if we can, we can get him back here. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I think the, as, as, Jeff, as Jeff is trying to, to call back in, I think it's interesting to have these kinds of five major categories. And some of what I, you know, I was thinking about is that, that they seem to be these, these potential mega disasters, but they're also sort of combined. Um, there are lots of other times, there are lots of other types of problems um, that are not necessarily easy, easy to categorize within, within these different categories. Hey, Jeff, you're muted. We could keep you uh, <laughs> Welcome back. Yeah. Was that like an Oscar send off instead of the music? You just kicked me off when I'm too long winded. No, I, I think <laughs> I had an internet disruption here. Um, got a little too close to the truth, I guess. Uh, no. Um, uh, so I think we got all five out. Yes. And then we sort of lost you from there. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so what, what I was really getting at is that so each of these scenarios really is where human development and human activity is contributing to both the uh, overarching threat as well as the underlying vulnerability. We're quite literally burning the candle at both ends here, um, whether climate change and pumping out uh, carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions and building more and more infrastructure in vulnerable areas uh, for pandemics, for, you know, uh, uh, being more interconnected as a world for encroaching upon biodiverse and ecological environments where we see a lot of diseases jump to humans and then underfunding public health systems and things like that. So they're all examples where uh, where we're really uh, sharpening both edges of, of the knife, so to speak. Maybe that's not the best example. Um, but at the same time, it's also within our control. Because we're contributing to these threats and vulnerabilities, it means that through our actions, we can also reduce these threats and these vulnerabilities. And so in addition to simply articulating and describing the bad things that could happen, uh, it, it's really intended to help illuminate ways that we can change the way we're developing, the way we're, we're moving forward into the 21st century to build resilience rather than build up these threats and vulnerabilities. All right, that, that really does help me to clarify a little bit because that's sort of one of my follow-up questions was why climate change instead of say natural disasters, but it seems that you're saying because there's some sort of human element contributing to it, um, that that's why you decided to focus on something like climate change as opposed to on natural disasters. Yeah, yeah. So there's, you know, whether it's a, an asteroid hitting Earth, um, that's probably not something where we're contributing to that threat, um, unless there's something I don't know about, which there's a lot I don't know about. So uh, uh, maybe we'll put that in the second edition. No, um, talk of, you know, the, the volcano under Yellowstone. You know, a colleague of mine um, in San Francisco, Daniel Holmes, he gives the example a lot of times that, you know, an earthquake is not a particularly hazardous event if you're in the middle of a field, not surrounded by a lot of things and not on the epicenter. Now, if you're in Port-au-Prince in Haiti with a lot of concrete construction, um, not built up to certain codes, it's an extraordinarily hazardous event. Um, so I think that that's, that's, that's a really important point, right, is that disasters are a combination of those threats and those hazards. And in these cases, these are ones where human activity contributes to both. There's certainly more that could be included, and there's certainly other hazards that we encounter where we contribute to the vulnerability, even if we don't necessarily have control over the hazard itself. So um, these were the five to help frame out some cross-cutting issues. Um, but, but, you know, like any inquiry, it's sort of how we framed it out, but it's not, uh, uh, will never totally be complete. Right. I really like the, the kind of catchphrase that hazards are natural, but disasters are man-made. I think it gets at that point that you're talking about that it's not so much the earthquake that's the problem, it's all the structures that we built on top of it and around it. I was curious, because it just happened, right, the port explosion in Lebanon, would you consider that to be critical infrastructure failure? Or is there maybe room for like a, a corruption or, you know, stagnate, you know, political stagnation category even? Yeah, and, and that really does get into, I mean, some of it's kind of an infrastructure issue, right? It's in a port area. It's here you have these, uh, what appears to be these just old stockpiles of ammonium nitrate left, uh, left vulnerable. Um, but I think of these cross-cutting issues, and that's sort of the later chapters of the book. You know, we take these examples and these scenarios and we play them out, but really they help to illuminate the cross-cutting um, themes that are coming through this, and governance is absolutely a part of that. Um, you know, uh, and, and it, it it goes both ways. So on the one hand, you know, poor governance can lead to increased vulnerability, um, can lead to ignoring these threats that are festering and building. Um, at the same time, and I think at, using Lebanon as an example, we're seeing that the government resign as a result of this. Disasters can be deeply unstabilizing for uh, government structures, particularly those that are, are sort of teetering on the edge for a variety of reasons as well, too. Um, climate change in particular, there's already um, those who have suggested uh, that it's been a contributory cause to the Syrian civil war. Uh, obviously not the only cause. There's a lot of things going on. I don't mean to oversimplify any of that, but there are some scholars within the Earth Institute and elsewhere who have looked at these uh, massive droughts and the, um, uh, affecting the agriculture there and sort of, you know, helping to nudge things towards a tipping point. Um, although all of these challenges are, are far more complex than, than meets the eye and sort of over ascribed to any single cause is to uh, um, miss the, the larger picture, for sure. Well, and I think we're seeing during uh, this pandemic, and I definitely want to touch on COVID-19, that uh, you know it, it is showcasing where we were vulnerable and where we had challenges 
already that were kind of chronic stressors. So we have the shock of the pandemic and then that gets even worse. So let's start there. You started with bio threats, seems prescient now, even though you wrote this be before um, COVID-19, but I understand why you were so concerned about pandemics. So how do you think um, that your framework is relevant to the current crisis and what might we kind of apply to make sure that we are applying good governance uh, in this situation? Yeah, and, and it's something where, you know, unfortunately pandemics and the emergence of a pandemic was absolutely of no surprise to anyone in public health preparedness and, and frankly to a lot of people out there in disaster management and other industries. Humanity is, is visited by pandemics with, with some degree of regularity. How bad it is, um, how far it goes, how pervasive it is throughout society and throughout the world is, is a bit of a variable, but it, it's pretty certain that we get hit with these periodically. And, and uh, um, frankly, we, we kind of expect it. No, of course, nobody knew it would be a coronavirus coming from, you know, uh, where it came from, the way it came from. Um, but right, I think influenza. Right. Exactly. Yeah, influenza was sort of where where everyone's money was because that's where um, uh, where we typically see pandemics emerge is these crossovers, and that has to do with some of the the uh, dynamics of the disease itself. Um, but certainly not the only one. And coronaviruses were on the radar along with others. Um, but I think that it does show, you know, in, in preparing for pandemics and looking at pandemics, you're looking at all different sectors of society, right? It's not just an infectious disease issue. It's a governance issue. It's a communications issue. It's a supply chain issue. I mean, we're seeing here these uh, global just-in-time supply chains, which are great for really efficient business when in the absence of a pandemic, but they become very, very fragile and disrupted as we're seeing with all of a sudden an explosive surge in the need for personal protective equipment, for ventilators, for vaccine production, things that, that don't necessarily have a, uh, um, uh, a business case in the absence of a pandemic, um, but where a lot of that infrastructure is, uh, resides in the private sector. And so I think that there's a, a lot of thinking about that. Um, and, and public messaging and, and consistency in that messaging is obviously a very important part. And then, um, you know, looking at how this affects other aspects, the economy, how it affects uh, um, the development of children and their ability to go back to school, um, particularly for something as prolonged as a pandemic. So, so each one of these is almost like a lens to explore how all these different sectors of society come together or don't come together um, to, uh, to achieve resilience in the face of these, these mega disasters. Right. So uh, you, you mentioned children, and I know that you have extensive, you've done extensive work on the unique challenges that face children during disasters. I think that's particularly relevant right now, given the conversation that we're having about whether it's possible or even advisable to reopen schools. We're having a lot of conversations about, you know, how this particular pandemic is affecting children and that they can get sick on the one hand, get other people sick, but also, you know, schools serve so many, so many needs for, for children and children's health. So I was want, hoping you could kind of get into that. What are, what are some of your top concerns um, for children? Do you think it's advisable to reopen schools and kind of how is this all playing out? What are the different factors? Yeah, th this is really a, a, a huge question that I, I think is, is not necessarily getting the depth of discussion that it needs, although there are some out there. Our director, Dr. Erwin Redliner, um, has been out speaking about this as a piece in the Daily Beast actually today or yesterday um, on this as well, too. Uh, but, but it really does come down to, so on the one hand, from an epidemiological perspective, uh, schools are a great place to spread illness. <laughs> it's You have a lot of kids in one place. Uh, anyone who has kids or has been around kids knows that sometimes things like cough etiquette, sneeze etiquette, you know, you don't have great compliance, although adults, you aren't that good at it either. So, so don't, don't hate on that. But the, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've got data to support that. But with the, um, uh, but, but in all seriousness, there, there's also certain diseases where actually kids can be more efficient transmitters or where they can um, carry the disease and spread it for longer periods of times, even with less symptoms. COVID-19, it's unclear. There was some evidence suggesting maybe less transmissibility, but that was compounded by schools were closing when a lot of this data was collected. There's more and more evidence coming out suggesting, if not showing, that um, children are more efficient carriers, that, that this is an environment where um, they could be uh, really spreading disease, and not just among each other, but taking it home. And even if they're not as clinically vulnerable uh, to the severe outcomes. They're interacting with people and, and facilitating the spread in the community. 
but that's on the epidemiological side. On the child development side and the social needs side, there are windows in a child's development trajectory. And when you miss them, they're gone. It's very difficult to, to bring that back. When we're talking about a pandemic with a timeline of a year and a half, two years, potentially longer, you can't just put everything on hold for two years. And we're not necessarily equipped, um, and in not all cases is it appropriate for all age groups to go to distance learning and remote learning. Um, and so, so this is, and, and as you mentioned, uh, Chloe, this is also, uh, you know, in cities like New York and in urban areas, but really across the country, schools are oftentimes a lifeline. They're providing meals for kids who wouldn't otherwise get three meals a day. They're providing social services. Uh, they become that bridge for mandated reporting uh, for situations of abuse, for identifying medical or behavioral health issues to help parents um, refer them and identify these issues and bridge them on. So it's not a no-brainer and the costs are very, very significant to doing this. And where that line exists between opening schools and, and not opening schools I, I think the question really needs to be, how can we make it as safe of an environment as possible? How can we exceed the guidelines that are out there? Um, how can we retain as much as possible the need for development and the access to these services while at the same time balancing that with the realities of what's known so far in terms of um, the potential for COVID-19 to transmit there and in the community and for other people to, to get sick and have some of the severe outcomes. It, it's not a simple question. I think it does require more, a more robust discussion, a little less polarized discussion, but also some flexibility because different localities, different communities are going to have different transmission rates, which will create different options for having schools open or closed as well as different um, social needs um, for the children and, and the role of schools in that. And in some cases, it's just straight up real estate. You know, it's, it's is there enough space in the school to space kids out? and that's hard to do anywhere in, uh, in, in Manhattan and a lot of New York City. Yeah, we're going to have more challenges, say, holding classes out of doors in a place like Manhattan than, in, you know, somewhere in the country where they might be able to take kids outside more often and get them fresh air and space and, and that can help. But one thing we know for sure is that it's, you know, it's difficult to think about how nobody really knows. We have some good ideas from, you know, the continuity community and public health community and and uh, obviously school administrators, so many great minds are working on this challenge, but, but nobody knows. And, and that's the, the big challenge. And, and that's why it's creating so much fear. So, you know, my heart goes out to everyone who's working on those plans. I know I've had a lot of conversations around it. But I also wanted to uh, sort of turn to the economic impact, because we know that unless if the schools don't open, that has a tremendous, that hobbles our economy, totally. Um, and there is a, a huge uh, economic impact of anything like this. We're seeing that as well, and it's hard to, to balance. One thing we, we know for sure and we're already seeing is that the economic pain is certainly not equally shared. And um, so after physical disasters, this plays out as a distinction between economic activity versus economic welfare. So is that the same here? Can you talk a little bit about the, the, that distinction and whether that plays out here as well? Absolutely. Uh, and kind of bridging, I, I want to touch base on something you mentioned about schools, too, is that, is that we're mired in uncertainty. And that's a big theme in the book as well, too, right? Across all these different disaster types, is we really have to get to a place where we can manage uncertainty. Even if things right now stay exactly the same for when schools are back in session, and in some cases they already are, that can change. Transmission rates can go down, they can go up, which is going to require shifts and things. And so I think managing uncertainty, and this is getting people very close to that concept of uncertainty and, and it's going to be here for a while and across all of these uh, we can't impose certainty on things that are inherently chaotic um, but we can develop and implement frameworks for managing that uncertainty. Um, to answer your question more directly about economic activity versus economic welfare this is something we see time and time again across disasters whether from hurricanes, tornadoes, wildfires, pandemics now uh, is that certain communities fare better than others. Um, and even when it comes to access to the kinds of programs that are supposed to be great equalizers from disaster assistance, there's some research coming out of a couple of different universities looking at how these federal assistance programs actually widen inequality. They tend to be easier to access if you're white and wealthy than if you're poor or from a community of color. Uh, now the full extent of exactly why um, is, is being explored. Um, I suspect uh, that with any of these, there is a tremendous amount of complexity uh, involved in even applying for these programs. If you're in a situation where you have a lawyer and an accountant who can look at this for you, it's very different than if you're not working in your hourly job and not getting paid and 
kids aren't in school and you're trying to pull receipts from a flooded house, you know, all these different things. There's also been um, some reporting where folks go and, and get different advice based on the color of their skin. So there's some very, very profound issues here that when you average out and you smooth these economic trend lines, you lose a very important part of the story, which is that there are people who are not experiencing this disaster and not experiencing this recovery. We see this in areas in, uh, there's some data out of the City University of New York is doing some tracking surveys in New York City on people who are, their effect um, from the COVID-19 pandemic. And you're seeing a disproportionate impact on uh, the Latinx community, on African-American communities. Um, in particular, you're seeing um, uh, these communities are not only a greater economic risk, but also greater physical risk. They're, they're being infected at higher rates for a variety of reasons, social determinants of health, higher uh, uh, rates of um, these chronic conditions from generations of, of, um, of systemic racism. But then you're also seeing um, that, that this is who a lot of the quote unquote essential workers are. These are folks who have to go into work. They're required to go into work, which means they, in new, places like New York, they have to take the subway. They have to put themselves at greater risk than others. They don't have the benefit of, of calling in virtually to meetings for work and being able to work from home. Uh, so these, these structures set the table for any kind of disaster that uh, emerges. Right now, we're seeing this play out with COVID-19 um, because that's the disaster that we're focusing on and where we're harvesting the data on. But it's a very similar story throughout all disasters. This is why those cross-cutting themes are so important, right? Because if we're just looking at the scenario, we're missing that these are societal structures that are adding to our vulnerability um, while at the same time perpetuating injustices that uh, that we continue to struggle to understand and more importantly, undo. Yeah, even though our attention is, is being brought to the sudden shock, it doesn't mean that the chronic stressors, stressors go away. They just get deepened and right. changed. Um, so with this disaster and with, with anyone really, um, there's always the question of why, how, did, how could we let this happen? Why didn't we do more? Why couldn't we be more prepared? <laughs> and so, um, we know in our community, of course, that disaster prevention is chronically underfunded and that we're always responding to the last disaster instead of to the next one. So I want you to talk a little bit about that. I know that um, this was a big conversation after the very active 2017 hurricane season and there was some legislation that was moving towards investing more in, in prevention and preparedness, which is a good sign. But I was curious uh, what you think of this and, and how do we really balance um, those kind of conflicting needs? Yeah, so th there's two sides to this. One, um, particularly when we talk about like, like public funding for this, is that um, you know the incentive structures that we have in place are really heavily favor response and recovery over preparedness funding. And a group of political scientists really looked at this um, in a variety of different contexts, but one study in particular that I, I, I go to a lot looks at uh, natural hazards and, and uh, disaster policy and voter behavior. And in general, voters very heavily reward or punish an elected official based on the amount of recovery funding that comes in um, to the point where you can actually put a dollar amount on how much recovery money leads to a new vote for you. Um, it's, uh, so it's the ultimate in incentives for an elected official is bringing those votes in. But when you look at it for preparedness funding, there's no correlation. Voters don't celebrate, they don't punish, they don't, they don't connect on that. Um, and, you know, I'm not sitting here trying to say, well, you know, all the voters don't know what they're doing. It's like, I don't think we've, I don't think we've communicated the value enough for voters to take that to the ballot box. Um, and instead of asking the question, how much recovery funding did we get? I think the question should be, why do we need so much recovery funding in the first place? Uh, and then the other sort of getting to the, the more holistic side, including the private sector and elsewhere, you know, the um, International Building Institute, I think that's the name of it, did a study for FEMA looking at, and this is where you get this, you know, $1 in uh, mitigation or preparedness saved $6 in response and recovery. This was great for us in the disaster community and the disaster research community. Now we had a number, we could say, oh, $1 saved six. Um, and it's true, but this was a very specific analysis for a very specific kind of investment. We know that preparedness saves and nobody's gonna disagree with that. But the question is, when you have a developer who's being offered millions of dollars to develop in this floodplain, and they're going to get paid when it's finished, not 30 years from now with the floods, 
and they're trying to keep their employees employed and trying to keep their families fed and things like that. Um, you know, if you have a, a trader on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange who's trying to, to shave, uh, you know, two and a half cents off of a transaction. So, so this is all just to say that there are things that we engage in every day that we actually have not done a good job of describing the value of preparedness into. And even at the individual level, I, everyone will say, you know, oh, preparedness is great. We need to put more on preparedness. Um, but what does that translate into, into everyday actions and everyday, you know, how we, how we um, balance our checkbook? Um, and, you know, we can say things like, you know, everyone needs a week's worth of food and water. But what about people who have trouble putting food on the table and rely on things like free lunch programs at schools to, to feed their kids? That's not such an easy thing. Um, so, so the conversation is up here. Um, but we live our lives sort of here at this transactional level and, and run our organizations there. And, um, and I, I think that, that the research community, as well as in partnership with the private sector and nonprofit community, really owes it to greater society to um, take it to that next level and to look at what is that value proposition, what does that look like, and what is that long-term benefit in the way we calculate things, because we're, we're most likely underestimating the risk that is built into our decision making. And we're seeing that play out now with COVID-19 among other disasters. So when it comes to readiness, are you telling me that you had a sufficient stock of toilet paper? Were you ready? Boy, I do now. <laughs> <laughs> are you kidding? No, the, uh, um, yeah, I, I will say yes, but it was only by serendipity. My wife had, had gone right before there was this whole surge and bought like a big old thing of toilet paper. A whole closet full. Yeah, it was, it was clearly, it was not foresight on my end by any chance. It was a little bit of luck, um, a lot of bit of luck. <laughs> and uh, yeah, now we're kind of keeping some extra, extra on hand um, at an undisclosed location. I don't want anybody. <laughs> but it, no, what you're saying really is true that, you know, the problem is with, with if you invest a lot in preparedness, then nothing happens or what happens is minimized. And so then you have this question about waste. Why did we spend all this money when nothing happened? And that conversation can be can be frustrating at times. So I was just curious if we if we opened up our perspective a little bit more. Do you know of any international examples, perhaps, where this is working well, or are there any examples of international cooperation where they're really kind of figuring this one out? Yeah, um, you know, I, I I've kind of been struggling with how to answer this question uh, <laughs> because this is one of those things where I do see a lot of folks out there writing and kind of celebrating work. And you can very much cherry pick this. If you're trying to make an argument that the way everyone is doing things right now is wrong, you can poke holes in any approach. At the same time, if you're, say, an NGO or investing in a model city or something like that, you can point to all these things going right. Um, so I, I think it can be misleading to say this place has it right, this place, place doesn't have it right. At the same time, there are things that are worth looking at um, and, and taking these examples and then integrating them into how we think about this. So I know uh, in Taipei, Taiwan, they've, they've experimented with a lot of these sponge city concepts to avoid flooding. So this is kind of the built environment and, and a lot of parts of the world really to look at, you know, more permeable surfaces so that the water sort of gets absorbed and maybe has a slow release. Some really interesting things there. Um, a colleague, um, Daniel Aldrich, has done a lot of work among many others looking at social cohesion, social capital and how some of the greatest investments we can make actually aren't in physical infrastructure, but they're in social infrastructure. Now, a lot of times those are better determinants of health. And he has examples both of the pluses and the minuses in um, the aftermath of Katrina, as well as um, he has a book, Black Wave, uh, looking at Japan's 311 triple disasters and looking at some of the different dynamics there as well too. There, there's been a lot of attention, particularly in Colombia, post the uh, narco wars of the 80s and 90s, looking at Medellin and some of the other communities there and some really innovative things there. This isn't to say that there aren't problems, that there aren't high crime rates, that there aren't issues of corruption in, in various places. Um, so I, I think with everything, it's important to celebrate what works well and to, to take that, but to also recognize the broader context and the broader trade-offs. Um, you know, a colleague of mine in um, Spain, uh, Lorenzo Cholari, is, is uh, a met him at a conference focused on urban disaster resilience. And a lot of the work that his center is doing is they're looking at trade-offs. So you can actually invest in, in physical infrastructure at the expense of social infrastructure, mm -hmm. where you can cut towns off. Um, and so there are all these different elements of resilience where you can have a shining example in one area, but you've done it at the expense of another area. So 
I, I use the example a lot of a Rubik's cube where, you know, resilience and the way we talk about it is really all of these different factors. And if you're just focused on one side and trying to get that to be, you know, all one color, you're actually manipulating other parts of society and may not even be realizing it. I haven't yet figured out if, if I had a Rubik's cube, I just take the stickers off and rearrange them. But uh, that's where my- And it all looks good on the outside, but maybe internally, who knows? Yeah, the, the metaphor starts to break down at that point. Yeah. <laughs> but, but speaking of the different components and the different parts of society, I, you know, we have to talk about the private sector and its role in all of this, because yeah. just as da disasters don't respect borders, they don't respect sectors either. You mentioned a little bit about supply chain readiness and what an important piece that is and how, you know, market demand um, dictates in part what supplies are available. So we know that we probably think that public-private partnerships are part of the solution here that, ha that um, can help us to solve some of those challenges. And yet a lot of them kind of get set up and then fizzle. Um, do you have any thoughts on why that might be and, and what we could do to maybe we need some more, you know, Eldridge style community building? I don't know. What is it? Yeah, yeah well, and I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I, I think that one of the shortfalls that we've had over the last several decades is that we've been relying on government to regulate and grant our way into preparedness. And that's not enough on its own. And there have been some partnerships and we're seeing them play out now actually with COVID-19 in terms of relationships with uh, the healthcare industry. Um, and we're seeing this both globally as well as nationally in terms of uh, just rapid development of new batch scenes and sort of strategic investments in certain technologies, things like that. So I do wanna, you know, I don't wanna say that this hasn't been happening. Um, but at the same time, I think it is also something where it's, um, uh, you know, like I mentioned before, like, like we need to make the case for this. Why is this so important? Now, as you mentioned, you know, the vast majority of our recovery infrastructure is in the private sector, depending on how you calculate it, what study you draw from 80, 90 percent, but it's most of it. <laughs> Let's say it's most of it. Transportation, supply chain, you know, and, and um, at the same time, a lot of these, these measures for, for value in the private sector don't necessarily um, appropriately price in risk from climate change or risk from pandemics. Um, a lot of times we'll look at what happened in the last 10 years, or the last 100 years, but in a changing world and in a, literally a changing environment, the past is not prelude. We need to include uh, well-based projections on how, so that the past can provide lessons um, but we're seeing things with increased regularity and with new nuances to those kinds of risks and increased vulnerability. But also I, I've seen some interesting ideas of integrating like a, a sustainability modifier into how net present value is calculated. Um, I've seen things like, um, um, uh, 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 we've written actually a colleague of mine, Jackie Ratner and I looking at, at bond ratings and how you know, ES and G bond ratings, how climate change is primarily measured under E, but the societal impacts and the governance impacts that cascade from disasters um, actually affect the S and the G and the ES and G ratings as well too, um, even though it's not currently part of the calculation. So some of this comes down to the math and just making sure that the math is more comprehensive. Uh, but again, in order to do that math, in order to revise that math, we need more precise inputs than saying preparedness saves. Um, and we can't take that one dollar save six dollars from another study in another field and say that that applies everywhere. Uh, so it, it's certainly a shared responsibility, but I, I do think that a lot of the solutions that, that are emerging and are going to emerge are going to come from the private sector as much as anywhere else. Absolutely. I mean, we could have a whole conversation about indicators and about what investors are looking at and, and all of that. And, and I love that conversation. Um, but we're getting tons of good questions from the audience. So I want to get to those. But first, I'm going to ask you one last question. And then we're going to do a lightning round. So last question is, um, and I really just wanted to touch on this, because in your discussion of nuclear threats, you question our, quote, operational assumption that giving people good information will lead them to take informed protective action for themselves. So yeah. talk to me a little bit about the psychology of disaster preparedness and why so often people just act like ostriches and stick their heads in the sand under duress. Yeah, so folks may recall a number of years ago, there was this false uh, alarm in Hawaii of this um, uh, a ballistic missile, incoming ballistic missile. And a lot of people just ignored it. Some people panicked. Um, and, it, and the whole conversation was on this false alarm. And there's this image I'll never forget of a father taking a storm drain grain off, lowering his son into the sewer, uh, 
and then putting the grate back on. Um, and I, I'm thinking to myself, like, like, and then the conversation afterwards was how they were going to fix the button to prevent another false alarm. And I'm like, so if it's for real, that guy's still going to stick his kid in the sewer, right? And then these other people are still going to ignore it. So like that was, I, I feel like that was a huge missed opportunity along these lines. Um, and again, I'm not trying to, to, you know, throw shade at anyone who is, you know, it's a fight or flight moment, uh, but it does open this door that people are, are vastly unequipped to interpret that information when it comes forward. And how do you have that conversation with them? And so on the one hand, it requires a deep investment of time and energy to communicate with everyone uh, uh, on this and to communicate with them through different forums and through different mechanisms. Um, but the other to get into this, like, yeah, in emergency management, we, we tend to want to saturate people with information, academia as well, too. Here's a study. Let me know if you have any questions, right? <laughs> it's, uh, uh, but at the same time, it's, uh, and we're looking for the right combination of words to get someone to do something that we want them to do. Uh, COVID-19 right now, how do we get people to wear masks? But it's much more nuanced than that. Uh, I remember talking with a, a, a colleague at uh, University of Delaware, Joseph Trainer, um, and I, I hope I'm paraphrasing this correctly, uh, that he, he, he was talking to me about how, you know, we, it's actually the wrong approach to try to come up with how to make someone do something. That actually in any given environment, there's a range of behaviors that people are likely to do. And what you actually want to do is steer them towards the behavior that's most beneficial and plan around that rather than try and force feed a behavior that they may not be likely to take on their own. So I, I think when we look at resilience in 21st century disaster, um, we definitely need the sociologist, the social psychologist, the behavioral scientists at the table uh, because the, the very um, uh, deterministic model of uh, how, how do I say this and push out this message, uh, we have plenty of evidence that it just um, doesn't work to the level that we want it to, except in very, very specific circumstances. Yeah, totally. We'll, we'll, we all have to work on our own risk psychology and reevaluate things. Mm -hmm. So quick lightning round. Um, okay. I'm going to start you off with some easy ones so that we, we get the format, and then, and then it'll get more topical from there. So okay. short answers, very short. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Bacon or sausage? Bacon. <laughs> Columbia or NYU? Don't answer. It's okay. Don't answer. <laughs> NYU. What's your favorite disaster movie? Um, so it's actually a show, uh, Jericho. It was this little series about this town that was like everywhere around it was nuked and it was like really focused on, on kind of the town and how they coped with that and how they reached to the outside world and stuff. I thought that was a pretty good, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I already cheated on three questions. You did. What keeps you up at night? Uh, 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 business processes. Mm. But it's, it's not actually the substance of, of the challenges we face. It's the paperwork. I'm sorry. Uh, which of the five disaster types scares you the most? Uh, ooh, um, that's a good one. What are the five types again? Wow, I'm really stumped on this one. Uh, <laughs> climate change, nuclear threats, cyber threats, and critical infrastructure failure. You know, I, I'd probably say either critical infrastructure or cyber threats, because these are the kinds of things we rely on every day and we really take for granted. And when they disappear, you're really sort of at a loss. You know, like I, I, I've got like five different ways of staying connected, but if the connection itself is gone, um, as you saw earlier in this conversation, um, you know, then it's, uh, yeah, yeah. All right, lightning round. Which sorry, one I'm five sorry. Do we have the best, what, which one of the five do we have the best chance of addressing here in the U.S.? Um, probably critical infrastructure, maybe, maybe bio threats. In There's been a lot of effort. <laughs> infrastructure, sorry. If, <laughs> if you could invest one trillion USD in disaster ready readiness, what would you do with it? Um, I'd probably put it into the next generation, investing in uh, the needs of children in disasters, but also education of uh, the next generation. Of when do we go back to normal from COVID-19? If we go back to normal, um, I think it'll be at least another year to a year and a half. What's um, your favorite part of working from home? Uh, being with my family a lot more. Least favorite? 
Uh, same. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I think that would be might be there. No, I, I you know what it is. It's um, uh, I, I've really taken for granted um, how um, how much getting up and walking around and meeting with people in person is um, a uh, uh, part of my physical activity for the day. <laughs> yeah, it's true. All right, I'm going to move to the questions because we only have a few minutes here. Okay. Um, and we've got some upvoting, so that's fun. An aspect of this pandemic are people who are unwilling to change their behavior or act in ways to protect others. Do you feel that this is a temporary phenomenon or is this something that we need to consider in future efforts around disaster planning? Um, yeah, I, I think so. There, there's actually uh, was a great article in Nature that was kind of a roundup of all the different behavioral science and behavioral science approaches to, um, uh, and, and so I, I think that and basically what it shows is that, you know, in some more collective societies, you have a better um, chance of, uh, uh, it's easier to implement things that require people to make a sacrifice that benefit others. Whereas more individualistic societies, you have some headwinds related to that. So I, I think that speaks to some of this and that there are certain elements of this we're always going to see anytime you're looking to change someone's behavior, uh, particularly when it involves a sacrifice, it's going to be a, uh, um, something that needs to be built into the plan and built into the things that you have to address and have to manage as part of that disaster response. So I, I don't think it's unique to COVID-19, um, although it certainly has some particular um, nuances and elements to it driven by an increase in polarization in our politics and some, some messaging at those levels. Um, and sorry, that question was from Emilia Lombardi. The next one is from Elaine Donderer. In other words, how can humanitarian actors address disaster prevention and remain impartial slash unpolitical if this is in fact a developmental issue such as infrastructure development? Yeah, I, I, I really struggle with this question on a regular basis because I don't think that you can extract the politics from the response. I think it's a very fine line though because it's a very slippery slope where you'll find humanitarian actors or NGOs or nonprofits who get maybe a little too political and end up undermining their own cause by alienating those who don't agree with them. But at the same time, the political environment, uh, you know, there, there's a, uh, you, you know, you look at the, the Rwandan genocide in the 90s. There's a, there's a great book, Shake Hands with the Devil, about, um, written by Romeo Dalier, the um, uh, UN general who was assigned, and, and therefore uh, a lot of it talking about how these NGOs who were uh, supposedly neutral uh, and didn't discriminate over who they were serving actually ended up feeding and clothing a lot of the, um, the armies who were then going into plain clothes and then being served by them. I think it's a cautionary tale that when you try to be neutral, you may end up being manipulated by others who would, who would take advantage of that. And at the same time, I, I, again, politics is part of the process. Um, it shouldn't be the identity of the process, but um, yeah, I know I'm not given a very clear answer other than I'm, I'm not sure that neutrality is a real thing. It's a complex question. Um, the next question is from Ellen Bannon. Do you have any examples where we were adequately prepared for a disaster? What did we do right and what can we learn from it for future events? Yeah, I, I think that there are a lot of times where we're adequately prepared and you never hear about it. So um, one, one example is, um, uh, you know, a lot of folks, you know, didn't wake up today with the gastrointestinal illness from the drinking water that they had. Uh, we see cases all the time. Uh, when I was an epidemiologist in Boston, I shouldn't say all the time, but you'll see cases of malaria. You'll see cases of, of um, uh, you know, folks who re are returning from overseas who have a disease um, and it doesn't spread in the community. Uh, you know, tuberculosis, there's still pockets of it, but it's not spreading. But the first disease investigation I worked on when I became an epidemiologist was polio. Um, and that was, uh, you know, in the 2000s. And it was, um, you know, an imported case. There was a refugee camp in Kenya that had a positive and a lot of folks who had come overseas from that. And there was follow up involved with all of that. So you, you never really hear about it when there's a good response to things um, because it's not very newsworthy. But I, I'd say they, they really do happen all the time. And I think finding ways to celebrate that and recognize that and tell that story would be very helpful as well too, to um, uh, articulate the value of, of what it looks like when things don't go wrong. Totally, no news is good news. The next question is from Christopher Ankerson. Um, it seems that there are quite a few overlaps in this fivefold understanding. For instance, environment, infrastructure, and cyber have a lot in common. Is there an advantage to the fivefold construction over an all hazards approach? 
Yeah, so I, I, I uh, so in, in emergency management, right, we take an all hazards approach and you build up the different functions that are, you respond in a disaster, communications, logistics, uh, command and control, and then, and then you start to rearrange them on the scenario side of things. How would you arrange those to respond to a pandemic or respond to a hurricane or something like that? Um, so uh, what the book does is it essentially does the reverse. This is actually a tension a lot where disaster professionals like a functional approach, like I just described. Elected officials in the public prefer a scenario-based approach, in my experience, because it, it's much more concrete. It's, you can talk about, well, what would we do if a hurricane hit? What would we do if a pandemic hit? So the book is almost taking that functional approach in reverse. So the five scenarios are really just a means to an end. So I actually agree with that comment. Um, I'm not sure if it was actually set up in a way to agree to or not, but I, I, I agree with the, the uh, notion that, um, you know, the, uh, the, the functional approach is ultimately what we need to get at, that society is actually built up of these different components and of these different functions, these different elements, um, and they play out differently in all five of these scenarios. So while I do the emergency management approach, in reverse for the book, it's actually towards the same end of being able to identify and build and manage these cross-cutting issues um, by the way that they're illuminated through these various scenarios. The next is from Kagan Lim. Um, I was wondering what communicating the value of preparedness might look like. Does it usually take the form of a quantitative value proposition? You know, it, it depends on the audience. And so I, I would say, you know, if you're talking with a, a financial firm, uh, that's looking to make a strategic investment, then yeah, there's probably a pretty big quantitative element to that. If you're talking with someone living in a community, it may be through um, a, a faith-based organization. It may be through, you know, expressing values of neighbors, helping neighbors. It may be, you know, it may be much less quantitative. So I, I think that that's the other, is that we need a, a very diverse set of messengers, um, but we also need it to be very tailored to the kinds of actions we're looking to take. Uh, if we need people to go in and check on their neighbors and there's a lot of value in that, that's more of a, a, a cultural value, value, a spiritual value. If we're looking at uh, the value of, um, uh, you know, wind resistant windows in a high rise in a coastal area or putting a generator on the roof, there's probably a pretty big quantitative element to that in terms of the potential money that could be saved. I guess it's sort of related this next question from Jamie. But it says, as we anticipate that there will be more and more disasters in the future, um, how do you think we could shift people's mindsets from disaster relief to prevention oriented in general? Is it more education, a shift in values? Yeah, I, I think it's all of the above. Um, you know, with more proximity to disasters and certainly with a lot of the um, funding that will inevitably come for supporting ongoing COVID relief, things like that, it presents an opportunity to really rethink how we do this. But it also means really rebuilding some of our response structures. And, and this is something that I think really needs a good look at, that our, our national response structures, our global response structures, for all the reasons we've been talking about for this last hour, they're built in a very ad hoc reactionary way with the best of intentions. But you know, to give an example, for federal funding alone, there are as many as 90 programs across 20 agencies that can be activated. And they're not all activated at the same time for the same reason. And even throughout a response, they can change. Um, 90 programs across 20 agencies, that's just far too many. And so taking a step back and saying, you know, rather than looking at solely at how to stop the bleeding, which is still important, we still need response and recovery, but how can these be restructured and how can these better incentivize preparedness to require less funding afterwards? That kind of holistic approach is um, hopefully something that will emerge with this sort of moment that we're in now. Um, but it's, it, it's much bigger than any single piece of legislation or any single act on any organization or, or even individual's behalf. I think we'll take one last question from Robbie Kieber. Uh, is there a sweet spot in recovery when you have found that folks or communities are more open to mitigation and preparedness activities? Yeah, there, there, there's definitely, and I think it's different for, for every community and it's different for different elements within each community. Because this is something, too, where a lot of times folks will come in really looking to recover. So if you go to Texas today or you go to Puerto Rico, you know, there's still people recovering from Hurricane Harvey and some of these areas in Port Arthur and Beaumont. If you go to, um, you know, there's still people recovering from uh, Hurricane Maria who were affected by the earthquakes, who were affected by COVID-19. Um, so, so with that caveat, I think that there is a moment where folks have a little bit of breathing room, but a little bit of energy to uh, look at new ideas and to propose new ideas. 
The problem is, is that a lot of times these recovery ideas are imposed from the outside. It's sort of a group that has decided this is the way to go and they're coming in and trying to get the community to back into these preconceived notions. And, and I would really like to see in the future taking a more community driven approach. Although these are regional and national and global issues, our, our, our planet is made up of communities. And if we don't address the needs of those communities, we can never hope to address the needs of, of our nation or of our planet. Absolutely. I think that's a that's a great note to end on. So thank you so much, Jeff. I'm going to turn it back over to Ruth. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Chloe, for that absolutely fascinating discussion and ending on that note of uh, how we all need to work together and bring the great minds together uh, from very different perspectives and different uh, from the community perspective to the global perspective and uh, think together about how we can develop more resilient, sustainable systems. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us and for your very thought-provoking questions. And uh, please do check out our websites and our social media for more information about the Earth Institute, the Disaster Recovery Institute International for Chloe's work, for Jeff's research, if you'd like to purchase a copy of the book, Rethinking Readiness, uh, that you can purchase that from Columbia University Press online or uh, any bookshop. Signed copies are available from Riverbend Bookshop. I don't know exactly where that is, but it's probably findable. Uh, thank you again. We hope you will join us again for another Earth Institute event. And thanks again to Jeff, to Chloe, and to everyone for joining.